Hi, Dan. Um, please tell us about your artwork, especially produced for this Clifford Chan's Tokyo Argus Pride Art 2021. Okay, so usually I work in the medium of photography, but for this exhibition, I really wanted to push myself to do something different and create more graphic prints. And so I collaborated with Ozaki san, who's like have five decades, 50 year long career in making prints. So I took a couple of images from my body of work, Disposables, that I'd created as a book at the end of 2019. I've taken two images from the book and I've blown them up to emphasize the meanings behind them. So I've got the sea snake here. Um, this is actually a few years ago, um, myself and my partner were on vacation in Okinawa. That's where he's from. And we were at a place where it's said to have the most beautiful night sky in all of Japan. So we were lying back on this concrete jetty on this beautiful beach at night and looking up at the stars. And then he kept saying, there are, there are insects, there are insects. And I kept insisting there are no insects near the beach, don't worry. Um, after a while, I gave up, we turned on the light and it wasn't insects, but in fact, a sea snake had come out of the ocean and that's what was kept pushing past us, um, which was a huge surprise because we had no idea that sea snakes came out of the ocean. Apparently they do. They come out of the ocean to find water at night. So for me, not only is it like a nice story, but this snake to me symbolizes something out of place, something unexpected, something being somewhere where it shouldn't. And I think we all have that feeling at sometimes in our life. Um, but also it, the snake is something that symbolizes danger, the original sin, um, which is why I wanted to repeat it seven, sign, seven times to resemble the seven sins. But I also wanted to take a moment and make it graphic and fun. The reason I wanted to use grey in the background is because it is, it's literally a snake on concrete. And the, the other image, this is something, I don't know why I feel a really strong connection to, it's a haikyo, which is Japanese for ruin. This is a World War II ruin of, um, people are familiar with kamikaze, which is of course the suicide airplane missions. But towards the end of the war, um, the Japanese forces looked at having manned torpedo and submarine suicide missions. And this is the ruin of the training base um, on off the coast of Nagasaki Prefecture. Um, this is one of the few places where you can actually see the remnants of World War II in Japan because so much has changed since then. Um, a lot of my work is about ideologies and symbols. And I think there is nothing stronger than a teenager giving their lives for the ideology of a nation. Um, I just feel a really strong connection to that. And the way the way that the building stands now alone in isolation, it represents isolation and at the same time protection. Again, these two things, the threat and then the idea of isolation and protection, the things that could resemble danger, but for me, I kind of find a strange like um, solace, solace and comfort. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that you pursued your career as a photographer and this is your first adventure out of your photography. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge you felt creating these lithographs? I think the challenge for me because of the proliferation in photography, especially in the past decade, is trying to, um, not to sound egotistical, but to try and try and how can I express the passion and meaning I find in a moment and make that resonate with somebody else because there's no point in making something to me if you can't get that resonance. So for me, it didn't really feel like a challenge, but it kind of met my challenge in being a release as in blowing something up and being completely graphic and really drawing attention to the kind of statement that I wanted to make behind the work. So um, how did you come to work as an artist in Japan? Um, well, I, I graduated with a degree in Media and Cultural Studies at uh, University in England. Um, that degree was mainly, it was very academic and not practical. So there was theories about societies and sociology, basically taking, taking cultural artifacts and seeing what they said about the society in which they were created. So when I came to Japan, I approached my own views on the country and people in the same kind of way. At first I was teaching English, but when I decided I was going to stay for longer, I looked at other things. I was taking photos in nightclubs and I found myself in the underground night scene. So in 2008, I started taking 
party and event photos, which led to me working with various luxury brands and traveling the world to cover different events. Um, that's an ongoing project. It tells a story about Tokyo, um, Tokyo youth culture on the nighttime. But between that, I was always more interested in the Japan that I found around me. So if I were DJ in, if I was going to go DJ in Fukuoka, I would make sure I was given two days off to go to Aso-san. If I was going to DJ in Sapporo, I'd have a day off to be able to go somewhere else. But I didn't want to carry my big camera. I always had disposable cameras. So disposable cameras, uh, like the shashin, the, 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 the way of capturing the moment of what Japanese sound is. For me, disposable camera does that because there's no, there's infinite possibilities of digital technology. With a disposable camera, you've just got to choose whether to put your flash on or whether to move closer or not, that's it. And it's the ultimate freedom. So I've got about 15, 16,000 images of Japan taken over the past 12 years. For my book, I chose 119 images. Um, I chose that number because Hiroshige, the woodblock artist, the famous Yukio artist, he used 119 images in his most seminal work, 100 Views of Edo. And Yukio is the floating world. It was the first time that a society had the means by which to not just work, but to enjoy the pleasure and leisure of culture. And I think that we kind of in Tokyo now, for those of us are privileged, we enjoy those moments now. We enjoy those times again now. So thematically and geographically and theoretically, I've connected my work to the Yukio artists. But doing these prints and working in a print format, this was the first time that I could practically link my work. So it was it's like kind of full circle moment to be able to make these prints. That's great. So you've been in Japan for about 18 years now. Yes. And since the time you arrived in Japan, do you think the LGBT scene in Japan has changed at all? Mm. Well, um, I think it's a difficult question for me to answer because um, now as I get older as well, I really, I really realize that the first thing that I read as in Japan is a white guy. And so if I was in the UK or something, there might be certain mannerisms or actions or turn of phrase which would identify me as being LGBTQ. Whereas in Japan, that's like second or third rank after after male, white or British, for example. And so my experience of being part of the LGBTQ community in Japan is very different to a Japanese person. Um, that said, um, having lived here for 18 years, it would be nice to have marriage equality and be able to celebrate love the same as other people. I think not having marriage equality in the you know, 21st century is um, shameful. This is Pride Month and I think that kind of thing is shameful, which is why we still have Pride, because it's still important. And um, I hope that in whatever way I can, that I can just kind of support LGBTQ Japanese youth to make them know that they are loved and supported and that there are ways forward. And, and I think it's important as well to note that Although there's no, not been any great national movements towards equality, there has been huge strides in terms of um, local legislations, whether that be in Sapporo or Osaka or even like in Setagaya, Nakano or Shibuya. Um, there are movements forwards. And I think into the past five years alone, there's been a huge surge in public support for equality of marriage. So things are heading in the right direction for sure. Yes. Or do you think art can be used as a mean for radical change at all? Um, I think the, the most radical thing that we can have is our belief systems. And I think um, art has the power to not only show us belief systems divergent to what our own, but also it can challenge our own, help us question. So I think on that basis, it can, because it's a portal to see the world in a different way. And I think especially in terms of the visual arts, um, it's, you know, it's the most powerful tool of communication since cave paintings years ago, which still resonate with us as, a, with as humans. I think that's it, that's key. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you so much, Dan. Okay. Oh, 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 oh,